So um, I would like to introduce our speaker for this uh, half hour, Jane Hutton, Professor Jane Hutton from the University of Warwick. Jane um, is a British medical statistician and her research interests include meta-analysis, survival analysis and ethics in mathematics. And she has participated in highly cited studies on autism and cerebral palsy. And Jane, over to you to talk about good reporting of epidemic models, mathematics, statistics, and uncertainty. Remember to turn it on. Um, so yes, uh, thank you. Thank you to Peter Coveney and others for uh, allowing me to speak. And thank you all for coming along now. Uh, let me see how we're doing. Yeah. Um, so this is, uh, me talking about things from a perspective of having been a medical statistician involved not in infectious diseases typically um, so i'm not coming at this as an expert in mathematical modeling or indeed an expert in infectious disease modeling but as a referee of uh, rather more COVID 19 manuscripts than i would have liked and so I thought it might be useful to this group to think more about how one might discuss uncertainty from the background that I'm coming from um, and mix that in with some of the other perspectives. And certainly with um, Rob Acker's talk and some of the issues that he raised about collaboration and reproducibility, I think these ideas might be worth discussing. Um, I did also think it was quite interesting discussions with Peter Vickers um, yesterday about how does one distinguish between consensus and groupthink. Um, it, it, can, it can be quite easy for any of us to sort of get convinced that the way we do things in our corner of the world is the right way. Um, but interesting enough, the development of these um, networks um, Came, came about because people were concerned about, medical statisticians particularly, were concerned about the methods being used and the quality of the methods. So it's known as Equator, and I, I've put this up simply because the slides will be shared, it gives people the link. And it's talking about enhancing the quality and transparency of um, health research. Because when I was young as an academic, uh, some people, including people local to here like Sheila uh, Bird were stirring things up and reviewing medical journals and saying your methods are useless. And of course, it doesn't actually make you very popular, but she actually looked at all the papers, you started documenting the mistakes there were and the consequences for that. I got involved actually on animal research to the M MRC and we tried to document the quality of reporting of animal experiments. And you couldn't actually assess the quality of the experiments because the quality of reporting was so poor. I mean, it, it really was quite spectacular what was not included in the academic papers. Um, my experience in working with a PhD, recent PhD student, is the social sciences are still pretty uh, hopeless. And um, interestingly enough, in the law, the UK is going down observational data. The US is beginning to look at experimental methods. But one of the most important things, I think, is if I'm going to search for a paper and read it, particularly with the proliferation, how can I be sure that I'm getting the relevant papers? And so this is, these guidelines are the idea of trying to say, how can we bring things together to make life easier and better for all of us? I hope that by focusing on the quality of the methods and not prejudging results, it's not just driving a, a groupthink, but it's in improving what's happening. And so I, I'd, in looking at the papers I'd refereed, I thought, goodness, the, the, these papers are going into the Lancet and so on. And if I was, when I'm refereeing other studies, like a randomized control trial for medicine or a meta-analysis or case control, um, the authors can be required to produce a checklist and they will actually say, we've given you this information, it's on this page. And that can be extremely useful 
including, in fact, in constructive refereeing, where you say, you know, what you've provided on page this doesn't answer this question or whatever. But I thought, gosh, there just seems to be nothing like this for epidemic modeling. You know, I get told nothing about the data, the quality of the data, the actual methods used. How did you decide on those parameter values? You know, what, was there any coherence in any of this at all? Um, I think one, one or two things particularly struck, struck in my memory. One was an article about vaccine strategies, which claimed to be universal of, of relevance, um, because they, they included data from Africa. It was from a small private hospital in the Democratic Republic of Congo, but on this basis, they claimed their research was applicable to the whole of Africa. I happen to spend quite a lot of time in Africa, and I'd be a little skeptical of that claim. Um, and another one cheerfully announced that the um, sensitivity and specificity of COVID tests, you know, sensitivity uh, about 100 percent, specificity 90 so and so percent, reference papers. Well, I was unkind enough to go and read those two papers, and that the statements in the papers were simply false. Uh, that's one of the papers, in fact, came from one of the major SAGE groups and determined a lot of UK strategy, and they simply falsely stated what their references included. So to <coughs> move on to the what is actually being <coughs> recommended, um, so you, I would hope you'll start to think that quite a lot of this ought to be obvious. Of course, obvious things aren't always done. Um, and so I'll just make a few comments. I don't necessarily want to um, detain you too long. But the idea is that you're trying to improve the consistency, reproducibility, comparability, and quality of forecast modeling. It's not actually saying anything about this is how you ought to do it. It's not trying to predict how you ought to do it. And there is actually a discussion about what do we mean by forecasting, predicting, projecting on that. And actually, there's also a reference into this about what do we even mean by mathematical models? Because, of course, there are very many of them. And again, if you talk to people outside of the mathematical sphere, you'll get other people with other ideas of what a model is. In engineering, it might be a physical object. In the fashion industry, it could be a person. Um, and those things, I think, are often one of the areas, perhaps, where there's confusion and therefore lack of efficient collaboration. So one of the, the medical stats um, standard approaches is to say the title in the abstract really needs to be informative. Um, you do get quite amusing editions of the British Medical Journal, Journal at Christmas with rather flippant titles, which is fun for amusement, but trying to get clever titles that don't reveal the content, of course, has some disadvantages. One of the reasons they, for, the, for that comment is searchability. Um, I think this comment on the introduction ought not to need to be stated, but as I say, as a referee, I think it often does. The idea that you just define what was the purpose of this particular study and your forecasting targets. You know, were you actually trying to forecast for a particular set of decisions like in Cameroon, we have a choice of different strategies for malaria control. And what we're going to do is forecast the effects of two different strategies in order to assess what we ought to do. Are we forecasting predicting number of COVID hospitalizations because it's going to affect policy? Uh, because if that's the case, then making assumptions that are clearly completely implausible will be contradict, you know, contraindicated by your stated purpose and your timescales. And then there's the idea of fully documenting the methods. And I know there's been discussion about having code open um, and quite a lot of debates about what should be included. I think for me that the aspect I would say of papers I refereed that was not what I considered fully documented was people saying, and we calibrated the parameters we put in. That is essentially saying, I chose the numbers that I feel like, and I'm telling you nothing about how I chose them. Um, and that I found was, was very common. 
and to me very unsatisfactory. It makes things completely unreproducible. Obviously, as a statistician, I come from a perspective that the way you choose your parameter values in relation to data, you know, there are well-defined methods of thinking about that. It's quite a good idea to use them. Um, one would hope that you don't have to say whether the forecast, that it would be automatic that people would say the forecast was prospective, real-time or retrospective. Um, but again, I've got experience where that basic thing isn't said. And again, it's not saying you shouldn't do any one of these, but they have different purposes. And to evaluate a paper, you need to know what the aim was. Um, again, one of my pet frustrations was finding out where that source data came from with full references. You know, we had data from some hospitals in Africa is simply not very helpful. Um, and nowadays, of course, with the often extensive use of supplementary material on the web, there's not that much excuse for doing that. Um, and I do appreciate you can't always provide the source data and certainly wearing another hat, which is getting involved in ethics of data sharing um, and general discussions of ethics and maths. I know there are very different views. So Scandinavia, for example, if I'm asked as an expert witness to look into something, I might well use Scandinavia as my model because it has much better quality medical research because it has a very different social contract. And you can actually find out what's happening without the biases that you get in the UK or the US. So it's worth knowing where the data is. Yes, it may well not be possible to make it publicly available, but you know there should be reasons for that um, because if you don't know what data somebody has really used, you can't really assess what's happening. Um, once I refereed something which was supposed to be talking about children um, and doing an analysis, and they had children were of three sexes, and that was not, you know, this is long before the days of the transgender lobby. Um, there was no explanation of that. And also ethnicity had three groups but you weren't told what the groups were. So conclusions were drawn about the impact of the ethnicity, but I had no idea whether the groups were white, you know, were English, Welsh, and Scottish, or Chinese, Caribbean, and, and, and European. Um, <clears throat> so you do want proper documentation. And again, very much the statistician's um, uh, view, and, and quite often I find people in machine learning have a very different view, Describe your input data processing procedures in detail. Now, machine learning or data science calls this wrangling. We always called it data cleaning, but same thing. Exactly what did you do with that missing data? What were the assumptions that you used? What was the quality? What were the extreme outliers? What did you do with them? That, that should, every last detail of that should be documented. I find it often isn't. So for example, the, the COVID data in this country, vast amounts of it is about 80 to 90% missing. So you don't just mean impute when that amount of your data is missing. If you do, you're simply going to feed back your own views to yourself. And this I found quite interesting. Staten describes the model type, which I think is it's a fun thing for mathematical scientists to discuss because we all have very different types of models and there is a, um, a reference in the document to the types of model there might be. Also document the model assumptions, including references. So if you are going to assume that nobody is going to change their behavior at all, which is why you get the results you get, or if you're going to assume that South African scientists are stupid so that they can identify the Omicron virus, but they're completely incompetent when it comes to assessing the severity of disease, and they're completely unaware of age differences, which was essentially the assumptions that were made in the predictions of the impact by some groups in the UK, say that, put in there your assumption, the South Africans can't be trusted, and then defend that assumption. Don't just assume all South African scientists are incompetent. Um, and cause considerable suffering to most people in Southern Africa on that basis. Um, 
again, model codes, that, that is something that was being discussed, of course, for climate change and so on. That, of course, does have this problem that, that Rob Ackers and, and other people mentioned. You may have legacy code. You may have correlations induced by all assuming you've got something right. Um, how you address that issue, given the resources we have, I don't know, but you might have ideas of how to make that possible. And of course, you may document the reasons why it's not possible. Again, I don't know how many of you work a lot in social sciences, but grant applications in social sciences, people are often required to say what intellectual property they will generate. And did you know you are not allowed to ask anybody the question, do you have a sense of humor? That question has been patented by a psychologist and only a qualified clinical psychologist is allowed to ask that question. And I'm not joking because I got told that in one of my studies. Um, but we don't in mathematics think in the same way, you know, you don't patent a pure mass theorem, you might patent code. And, you know, the cultures that we have about individual recognition and sharing, as I say, just, just as differing between countries, I don't know all the different cultures within sub areas of maths, certainly worth having a think about it. Methods of model val validation, you know, need to be described in detail and the approach justified. Um, you do increasingly get that now in medicine with analyses done and, and people actually saying where their models didn't fit the data and all that they've checked them and they're robust to certain kinds of deviations. I think that's <clears throat> incredibly um, important. And again, precision about the forecast accuracy evaluation method used and why that one was chosen. There are different ways you can do things. You might have good reason for choosing your particular one, but it's quite helpful to the reader to know what that is. And if there is some kind of benchmark, use it. Um, the paper actually says, you know, this might be a very simple benchmark, because this is not just talking about major pandemics. It might be a simple benchmark, like a, the seasonal forecasting or a week, a lag, one week autoregressor process or something, or there may be a well-established, but it's a good idea to give some comparison rather than have lots of different models all, all over the place with no real head-to-head -head comparisons. And I know from work in testing drugs, they're trying to stitch together comparison of different anti-epileptic drugs when they've never been head to head. Very good way of having a lot of uncertainty and not actually helping the people who will be prescribed those drugs. And think about the forecast horizon or possibly the projection horizon and the justification of why you've chosen that length of time. And I do appreciate that sometimes it might be, you know, the people who <coughs> asked us to do this insisted on doing it, thus doing it. And I've certainly produced reports where I've made it perfectly clear to Department of Transport that the questions they've asked are simply foolish. And I was quite interested that some of the SAGE people I've, I've talked to went, what do you mean, say that the question I'm being asked isn't, isn't right? You know, we're just being told to answer the question. As far as I'm concerned, the most important thing you can do in starting any problem is argue about what the right question is and whether the question that you might want to answer can be answered. And if it can't, what the sensible next step is, rather than just saying, but I was asked to answer this question. Um, that initial dialogue is incredibly important. And what results are you going to do? Well, surprisingly enough, this conference, I don't think I need to mention point uh, 14, um, your different uncertainty. Um, but also in most of these areas, you know, if we're publishing a paper on a particular efficiency of an algorithm, you're probably not going to get media attention. In most epidemic forecasting, um, it's going to be got a very high chance of being picked up. So it's a good idea if you do the translation um, into the press release or that sort of level, rather than leaving it to the journalists to try to understand, and particularly talking about their forecast uncertainty. 
Um, I think that is one of the things that the last couple of years has increased, is people's willingness to recognize uncertainty and changes, which is encouraging. And then, of course, if you're publishing results, um, there's a good reason for suggesting a timestamp version, because we want to know when did you test your results, and if you got a new result, what happened? I had a student once who decided for his project he would look at um, temperature data from NASA. And partway through his project, for some reason, I'd asked him about the data and he re-downloaded it and found the data had changed, but he could not find any documentation <clears throat> of the changes. Whereas if you've come from a pharma pharmacology research RCT side of things, you cannot make a single change to your data in theory without explaining why. Whereas if you can just rearrange your temperature data without documenting why at NASA, how can I trust any of that data? That's the point about time stamping and, and documenting what's happening. Um, another pet thing in the medical statistics world is, um, and the and healthcare world, is that the paper must discuss what its own weaknesses are. You know, my forecast assumes nobody will take any sensible precautions. People will behave as though there's no epidemic and therefore we will get 50,000 deaths a day. This assumption might not be valid. Um, so it's the methods and the data quality. Yes, a lot of the data is not very good. That's a reality, we can't change it, but you can say that fact. We can't conclude whether Boris Johnson was too fat in the sense of severity of COVID. We might conclude he's too fat for other reasons, but when he went into hospital, 50% of the data on obesity is missing. And I can tell you, because I've analyzed the data, it's not missing at random. So the conclusions about that, let alone the conclusions about ethnicity, where <clears throat> the next largest category after white is unknown, as opposed to blank, so there are two versions of missing, and the next largest category after that is other. You cannot conclude anything valid with that data quality, however much people jump up and down and say, give me an answer. <coughs> Obviously, if you're talking about specific epidemics, you might want to comment on what's happening. And obviously quite a lot of people I know are involved with neglected tropical diseases, and that's really pretty important because how the, you know, um, schistosomiasis or onchloriasis and so on spread around different parts of the world have similarities and differences, but certainly generalizing your vaccination policy for Africa on the basis of one hospital in Democratic Republic of Congo is decidedly questionable. So that's the end of that, but I hope it's the beginning, beginning of your contributions. Um, not, I mean, to this, if you, if you like, but also perhaps in, in what we've already heard about the questions about how you can work together more efficiently in the atomic energy or the fusion or any of these other areas, perhaps it would be worthwhile for people in those areas to think of, can we encourage you to report this in your papers? Um, I do appreciate the relatively free format in maths as opposed to the very rigid things you get in medicine, but perhaps there's a compromise. Thanks. Thank you so much for that very interesting talk, Jane. Um, so we do have a few minutes before before lunch, and I appreciate you finishing in a very timely <laughs> manner, especially just before lunch. So we have a few minutes for some questions for Jane. Um, before I take this first question, can I just point out that um, uh, my colleague Claire will put a link for our feedback form, which will will be in the chat um, after lunch. So and there are also paper feedback forms for our our participants here. So. I'll remind everyone after lunch as well. So, um, yeah, we have a gentleman at the back. Oh, you don't need that on. Hello, everyone. Uh, Derek Holm from Brunel University, London. Some of you may have seen me in the morning. Um, yeah, first of all, um, quite eye-opener. Um, I guess people 
leave, uh, take shortcuts all over the place, if anything. Um, I guess my question to you is that this, these guidelines seem really, really useful and valuable for publications, uh, but a lot of research uh, tends to be coming out before the publication is actually accepted. And sometimes research is also on a very high time pressure to try and produce something because the alternative is nothing. So I was wondering, is there a case to be made for perhaps a subset of these guidelines that you would say, okay, no matter where you put it out, you know, whether it's the, the local fanzine or a journal publication, this needs to be met at all times for sure. I, th I think it would be good for the communities to work that way. I mean, certainly, you know, I've now got gray hair. I've watched the development of medical statistics and the quality of reporting and results has improved substantially. And that's partly because quite a lot of people, including myself, in writing any kind of report, you know, even if I'm writing the longer version as a research report, I would actually just go through that checklist simply because it's very useful as a way of thinking, you know, what should I include? And whereas in medicine, um, so one of the things I was quite amused by, in medicine, the top journals basically said, you have to do this. So people were able to compare before and after journals saying you must adhere to the consult statement um, and see there was improvement in reporting and also much more improvement in the journals that said you must complete this checklist. Um, I think it would take quite a lot of time. I mean, it might be that, you know, the medical journals would adopt this for epidemic reporting, the top ones, and say, we're now going to insist on that. It's only publications. But it would be up to the community itself, if you like, to encourage one another and say, actually, this is useful. And yes, you may say, we made the simplifying assumption because there's nothing else we can do. And this is the implication. So with missing data, you know, there are some at least broad range things that I've done in publications, you know, with the missing data, this is the best case, this is the worst case. In some cases, that means you can still conclude the drug works. In other cases, you say, we can't be confident. But it, it's the honest communication of uncertainty, which I know is not very popular with decision makers. But yeah, so, you know, it's up to your generation to decide what you want to pick up on it. <laughs> thank, thank you both. Um, we've got um, a question uh, uh, online here from Tom King. He says, how much impact do guidelines like Equator have? What is the evaluation strategy? Um, thanks, Tom. So the, um, you, if you look at this paper, you'll find some links to it. The evaluation strategies have mainly been before and after, you know, take a, a year's worth of 2000, all clinical trials published in such and such journals in 2000, six years later, after the guidelines and by journal using the guideline and, and do a comparison on the quality of reporting. Um, again, I, th I guess the reason that you get a bit more of that in healthcare is they tend to have access to more money for these kinds of quite routine things um but yeah i mean it, it there is evidence that it is beneficial i've only mainly got the negative evidence of trying to read the animal experiment papers where we just wanted to see how many animals were used in each study we couldn't even work that out and, and to me that's a fairly basic thing you know how many animals did you actually use thank you jane um we did also have um, something, there was a hand up from Sri online. I don't know if Sri is there and still wants to make a point. Oh yeah, I mean, hi. Um, I, I was just wondering, um, now that the ep 4 guidelines have been uh, put out, um, have, they been, have they been made sort of mandatory for uh, reporting of uh, forecasting models or uh, or do journals necessarily I mean expect you to do that or is it just a guideline right now or you right. we would appreciate it if you did it rather than yeah, yeah. At, at, at the moment it's a guideline and you can actually go track through the website and make your own comments um, it was built up by consensus so there are there were quite a few sort of more subject specific things that didn't make it into the overall guidelines um, 
and as I say, with, with all of these, they are produced, the, the network is a network of guidelines. So you can always, you know, if there's a criteria, you know, a box that isn't there, there's nothing to stop an author saying, we have not done this for this reason. And so they are intended to be constructive, not, uh, not a barrier to communicating research. And they also do, uh, they do get updated and vary quite a, quite a lot. If you go even into the first one, randomized controlled trials, there's a headline one, but there may be 20 or more sub ones which deal with complex invention, interventions like surgery, which are different from drug trials or cluster randomized trials and so on. So it's very much up to people who are interested to contribute um, and improve. You know, they're not intended to be static, the guidelines. Thank you so much, James. Now I make it to 12.30 uh, lunchtime. So what I would suggest is that we, we break here. Obviously for those of you who are physically here, there will be the lunch period um, in which to have the opportunity to, to discuss anything further with Jane. And if any of our um, virtual participants have any bur uh, burning issues, please do just post that in chat. And I'm sure Jane will look to, to correspond with you after lunch. So thank you all very much. And we'll see you back here at 1.30. Thank you again, Jane.